from the National News Studio, Sri Lanka. This is the National News Broadcast coming to you live from Rupuwahini. Good evening. To bring you your stories for today is Thilana Uday Ratna and I'm Sharon Maskrinyas. The global crude oil rates remain high following the ban on Russian fuel. Ministry of Energy says the country continues to receive adequate quantities of fuel required for this month. Proposed urban development plans presented to the President. Tense situation erupted over a liquid milk issue in Parliament today. 40,000 rupee worth relief for hectare for sugarcane farmers. A face-to-face -face meeting between Russia and Ukraine foreign ministers. The ruling party secures the victory in India's Uttar Pradesh elections. Those were your headlines and moving on to this top story for today. Russia invades Ukraine and it's been 15 days as a deadly strike at uh, the populous city of Mariupol. An airstrike in a maternity hospital has sparked outrage, international outrage as well. Top-level talks started, however, there was no breakthrough. But to bring us more on this story, joining us today is senior journalist as well as foreign analyst, Mr. Prasad Dodangodage. Mr. Prasad, what a day. Tragic, horrific incidents that we see and still there is no release of tension. And then we see two countries come together even to have talks, but still there is no breakthrough. Yes, Sharon. Let's, let's uh, start our talk uh, from Turkey. The both parties. Uh, this is the first meeting, first high-level meeting between uh, Ukraine and Russia since the beginning of this war. Foreign ministry level talks. Uh, the both foreign ministers met uh, on the sidelines of Antolia Forum. Uh, an annual event organized by Turkey and Turkey was the mediator of these talks. As you mentioned in your introduction, uh, there was no breakthrough. The, actually, the both parties agreed to continue humanitarian activities. Uh, they have agreed to open seven humanitarian corridors for civilians to uh, leave the war zone. Uh, but uh, there was no any major agreement for uh, but, uh, the cessation of hostilities or uh, reduction of this uh, war um, activities, offensives, and uh, any uh, there was no any serious uh, commitment for both parties to end this war. Um, Sharon, it's obvious because uh, now if we uh, analyze analyze this situation very carefully, uh, the ground situation in Ukraine now. Uh, this uh, war has entered its second week. Now, let's take Russian side. Now, they are fighting with Ukrainians for more than two weeks. Mm. So, uh, but now they are in a, you know, they, they faced Ukrainian army, a very stiff resistance from Ukraine, Ukrainians. And uh, we have to remember Russia is a super military power. But still, they are fighting for two weeks. So, so now they are in a desperate condition for a breakthrough because uh, up to now they have only captured one major city in Ukraine. Mm. Other than that, uh, they captured a considerable area. However, they, they uh, still they couldn't capture uh, strategic positions like uh, Port City Mariupol, uh, for which they are fighting for more than uh, two weeks now. So uh, they are in a desperate position to make a breakthrough. So uh, with, with that intention, we, we don't see Russia is moving to end some kind of for cessation of hostilities. And for the Ukrainian side, uh, it's the other side of the coin. Now Ukrainians, they are fighting with the super military power for two weeks. Hmm. Ukraine, Ukraine is a small power, but uh, Russia is a big power uh, when we uh, consider but they're not the- giving up. Yes, they're they, 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 are, they are still facing Russians in a very, very, uh, very uh, strong way. Yeah. And uh, they, their morale, they, they are, the, their courage is very high. Mm. And uh, the, that's a big dis disadvantage for, dis disadvantage for Russians. And uh, the Ukrainian side, uh, because they think that uh, they, can, uh, they can have some kind of upper hand with the support of the Western nations. That's why Ukraine president, he is continuously asking for to implement a no-fly zone over Ukraine as well as uh, Western fighter jets 
uh, to fight with Russia. So they are also in a battle mood. Mm -hmm. So in this condition, we don't ex expect any any uh, uh, fruitful uh, peace activity on the ground. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation uh, behind the uh, negotiations. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned about the uh, fighting and the, the situation in Maripol and attack on maternity hospital. Yeah, the, these are the real casualties, real real uh, atrocities, uh, atrocities of war. Because uh, the, now, if this war drags on, the pressure will mount on Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the Ukrainian president uh, Zelensky, he also knows that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why uh, he let this uh, offensive to drag on. Mm -hmm. Because Ukrainian, uh, they are, their resistance is very high and uh, the, now they receive some uh, defensive weapons from the western side. Uh, now, uh, the Javelin missiles and Stringer missiles they received earlier from US and other western countries. Uh, those military hardware are very effective on the ground because we saw uh, they, they hold some Russian advance in uh, many areas including capital Kyiv. So, uh, this uh, war situation, actually the war is in a, you know, it's raging mm -hmm. because both parties are now highly committed for this war. In this situation, the real victims are civilians, the Ukrainian civilians, because mm -hmm. this war, ultimately this war is not a war between people of Ukraine or, or, and people of Russia. Mm -hmm. It's a war of uh, uh, international and uh, geopolitical uh, uh, needs of Russia and Western nations. Mm. So the Ukraine is became uh, Ukraine people uh, became victims of this situation. Absolutely and truly devastating, uh, Mr. Prasad. Thank you for bringing us those stories for today. And I believe tomorrow we'll have more insights on this. Uh, senior journalist and foreign analyst, Mr. Prasad Donangoda, thank you for bringing us that update on the Ukraine-Russian war. It continues as communication has disrupted. There's no food, there's no sanitation, and it continues for a long couple of days. But on a more global perspective, oil prices are on the rise and there is much more talk on this topic united arab emirates had confirmed on certain deals but here's the more detailed story of it Thilina. absolutely sharon uh, well oil prices seem to be rising today and amidst confusion over whether major producers would in fact assist in the relevant supplies to plug a gap in supplies of oil from russia itself the oil price rose more than 5% after a steep fall reported yesterday. Oil prices have jumped more than 30% since the 24th of February, touching 139 US dollars a barrel at one point this week. The oil price had fallen back to about 106 US dollars a barrel at one point yesterday, but by this morning it was trading at around 116 US dollars. US President Joe Biden and other leaders have pledged to try to ease the price pressures for households. The United Arab Emirates had appeared to push members of the OPEC producer group to raise output. Officials from the United States have been in talks with oil producers aimed at boosting supply. But the UAE energy minister said later that the Gulf state remained committed to the existing OPEC monthly output agreement, which fixes how much crude oil is produced by member countries. Saudi Arabia-led OPEC and an extended group of oil producers called OPEC Plus, which includes Russia, have agreed to avoid a price war and keep control over the market. Russia's invasion of Ukraine added new price pressures as sanctions make it hard for the country, typically the producer of about 7% of global supplies, to find buyers for its oil. The US and Canada have also announced bans on Russian oil imports, while the UK said it would phase them out by the end of the year. The International Energy Agency recently agreed to release 60 million barrels of oil from strategic national reserves, but this move will not be sufficient to respond to the recent run-up in prices. Now, regarding the crisis story, when it comes to fuel, Tilina, there has been a amount of talks regarding this, as the queues at petrol stations seem to be still on the rise. Absolutely, but there is quite a bit of talk about this crisis actually being resolved over the coming weekend or so. But uh, let's see what happens over the weekend, I suppose, Sharon. That's right. The Ministry of Energy says that the issues pertaining to the supply of fuel in the country expected to be resolved by this Saturday, and this will be no 
formalized by next Monday. The ministry's secretary, KDR Olga, said that the country is receiving the country is receiving adequate quantities of fuel at present. Two oil ships consist of 60,000 metric tons of diesel arrived at the port at a time when the country was hit with a full shortage. The Ministry of Energy said that steps were taken for the distribution of fuel to all relevant stations based on priority within an expedited methodology. Meanwhile, a ship carrying 38,300 metric tons of fuel arrived in the country today. Furthermore, 20,000 metric tons of auto diesel and 20,000 metric tons of aviation fuel expected to arrive in the country tomorrow. Another ship carrying 37,300 metric tons of diesel expected to arrive in the country on the 14th. The country expected to receive aviation fuel and diesel quantities under the Indian credit loan scheme as well as another couple of diesel ships ordered by the government at the end of this month. Accordingly, the country will receive 177,200 metric tons of diesel during this month. Minister Garmini Lokuge has said that full quantities required for every filling station in the country have already been deployed at present. The minister said that long queues for full should now be seized. He said that more than one load of full have been deployed to each filling station in the country at present. Meanwhile, Litro Gas Company has said that measures are being taken together with relevant authorities to resolve the prevailing gas crisis. The country is in the process of receiving necessary gas quantities required for the present demand in the local market for Litro Gas. Accordingly, the company has informed that the Litro Gas supply expected to be normalized within the next few days. Well, the government says that the finance minister has been fully involved in furthering the objectives cited in the budget. Well, these remarks were made while responding to a query raised by the opposition in the parliament today. Parliamentarian Lakshman Kiriala claimed that the finance minister lastly addressed the parliament on December 10th. He said that the finance minister has failed to deliver a statement over the financial situation of the country in the last three months. Responding to the query, Minister Dinesh Gunavardhana dismissed the statement. He said that the subject state minister has responded to the queries in agreement with the finance minister. He also said that various debates were held in parliament over the statements issued by the finance minister. Honorable finance minister's statements that have been made in open to the international media and to the local media, plus officially, has always been made, has always been debated by you all in the House and we have agreed on all those occasions when you are requested, plus our ministers have replied. Another heated debate took place in parliament today over the availability of liquid milk in the parliament canteen. Parliamentarian Nalin Bandare informed the speaker that it is his duty and responsibility to safeguard the honour of parliamentarians. He said that a media report was published over the parliamentary canteen. Parliamentarian Jayanta Katagoda said that the director of the canteen had made an inquiry over this issue. He said that no such issue had occurred according to the inquiry. He said that sufficient stocks of liquid milk are available. Therefore, the incident related to the alleged quarrel of the parliamentarians over liquid milk has tarnished the image of the parliamentarians. He said that the parliamentarians were given a vehicle permit before. However, the parliamentarians are continuing to render services to resolve the issues pertaining to the country while foregoing such privileges. Speaker Mahindaya Pabe Vardhana said that it has been observed that such a false media report was deliberately published recently, which can be identified as an effort taken to misuse the democracy in the country. <laughs> You're watching the news on Rupu and we bring you another developing story. The UDA has focused on key cities for development. The urban development has plans for several major cities were presented to the President Gotabe Rajapaksa at the Presidential Secretariat today. The Urban Development Authority, in collaboration with line agencies, has planned the development targets of the country in line with the government's initiatives and the development of major cities in a manner that will attract local and foreign tourists. 
Under the first phase, special economic zones will be developed in Gaul, Bandaravela, Ratnapura city centre and Thimirigasiaya, Fort, Peta and Kolupitia. Giving priority to the green city concept, it has been designed attractively with all amenities. The new plan includes a number of facilities including widened roads, parking facilities, pavements, shopping complexes and solar-powered street lighting systems. In implementing the plans, the president emphasized the need to preserve historic sites situated in the selected cities and to preserve all buildings in a manner that would get the attraction of the public. State Minister Nalako Gudaheva, Secretary to the President Gamini Senarat and Principal Advisor to the President Lalit Tunga were also present. State Minister Lohan Ratwata was sworn in as the new State Minister of Container Warehouse Facilities, Container Yards, Boat Supply Facilities and Boats and Shipping Industry Development before President Gautabe Rajapaksa at the Presidential Secretariat this morning. Secretary to the President Gamini Senarat were also present on this occasion. Well, the Gama Samaga Pilisandra program was initiated in accordance with President Gotabe Rajapaksa's vision of prosperity policy statement with the objective to provide swift solutions to the issues pertaining to the residents in remote villages. The first of the series of programs was in fact conducted in Haldumulla and the Divisional Secretary Division in Badulla. This is an inquiry into the progress achieved with the initial program. The inaugural program was conducted on September 25, 2021, encompassing several remote villages in Haldamulla. The people had presented their issues on this occasion to President Gotabe Rajapaksa. The main issues faced by the villagers had been identified as the dilapidated condition of the access road to the village, no electricity facilities, no shortage of drinking water and threats of elephant attacks. Witnessing the issues pertaining to the village, the president directed his stern attention in this regard. He then instructed the relevant officials to take speedy measures to resolve their grievances. Accordingly, the state institutions expeditiously implemented appropriate programs for rural development. The level of educational facilities of students in these villages were at lower level. The state of education on an active level had prevailed only at the Kumarathana Junior School. However, all students from grade 1 to grade 9 in this school were engaged in studies in a single building, of which classrooms were not separated. A new building building with smart facilities was constructed through the labours of the Sri Lanka Army at a cost of 3.7 million rupees. A solution was also provided to the teacher problem of the school. The school playground was developed. A systematic road network had been constructed taking into consideration of the travelling difficulties. Accordingly, a road of a distance of 16 kilometres stretching from near the 100-acre bridge of the Kumarathana Junior School and also from the school premises of Velanvita had been reconstructed with carpeting. The total cost of this project was 160 million rupees. The village lacking common transportation facilities had been provided with three buses. Electricity facilities had also been provided, covering all villages at a cost of 54 million rupees. Drinking water facilities had also been provided to the Velanvita village under the program to upgrade water supply and sanitation facilities at a cost of 80 million rupees. The communication facilities had also been developed. The main source of livelihood of the people in Velanvita and surrounding villages is agriculture. A processing centre of mine export crops including pepper had also been set up. Due to the inactivated status of the existing electric fence, the houses and crops of the villagers had been constantly subjected to severe attacks of wild elephants. To alleviate the problem, a 17-kilometer active electric fence from Velanvita to Kumarathana had been erected. The Sri Lanka Army personnel repaired the houses damaged by wild elephants in the Velanvita village. Well, the government has decided to grant a 40,000 rupee relief for a hectare of sugarcane production and farmers. State Minister Janaka Vakumra revealed this scheme during a media briefing at, that was held in Colombo today. The State Minister emphasised that the government has no intention of importing ethanol into the country. 
State Minister Janaka Vakkumbura said that the rate was increased by 500 rupees per metric ton for farmers since February. The government has also decided to grant a 40,000 rupee relief per hectare for farmers. The state minister said that these decisions were reached after considering price increases in fertilizer and other related products. The government also decided to provide an additional 100 rupees as incentive per one ton of supplied sugarcane since last year. Another 100 rupee incentive was granted from this year. 785,000 tons of sugarcane have been supplied, hence this privilege will be entitled to everyone. The farmers will receive 240 million rupees before the new year. And in other news to bring you the Gamasamaga Pilisandara My apologies. The Sri Lanka Podujana Perumana Provincial Councillors Forum said that the government took steps to achieve a massive development in the country amidst COVID crisis. Its Deputy Chairman SM Ranjit made these remarks while speaking to the media today. Deputy Chairman of the SLPP Provincial Councillors Forum, SL Ranjit, said that the government led by President Gautabi Rajapaksa was able to extend a massive assistance towards the national development during this period. He said that the government initiatives, including road development project, the program to allocate 3 million rupees for each Grama Seva division for infrastructure and economic development, the program to allocate 4 million rupees for the Pradesh Sabha councillors, and the program to enable provincial councillors and parliamentarians to assist the development initiatives in each district will assist the objective to further strengthen the economy of the country. Now, in more local news, Chief Executive Officer of the Samage Jana Balavegya, Ajit P. Pereira, says his party will not enter into an alliance of any sort with those who were expelled from their ministerial posts recently. He made these remarks during a media briefing held today. Chief Executive Officer of the Samagi Jana Balavegya, Ajit P. Pereira, said that they will not admit both former ministers Veeravansha and Gamman Pillai into their camp. He said that these individuals have encouraged racism and religious discrimination in the country. The Janata Vimukti Peramuna unveiled the, their policies recently, though they are yet to provide solutions for the prevailing dollar crisis in the country. He added that the JVP has no alternative plan in this regard. In other stories, former Minister of United National Party Sagala Ratnayaka says that all political parties should work together in order to resolve the crisis situation faced by the country. He emphasized that if political parties are continuing to work towards their narrow objectives at this juncture, such, as, such acts cannot be approved. Former Minister Sagala Ratnayaka said that the former Prime Minister Rani Vikramasinghe often emphasized in Parliament over the prevailing crisis situation in the country. He said that all political parties should join together without any political objectives to resolve this issue. He said that the national policies cannot be deferred based on the government benefiting the national development. He re-emphasized the importance in joining together to resolve the prevailing economic crisis before urging for an election. Now in other stories, the newly appointed U.S. Ambassador to Sri Lanka, Julie Chung, called on Minister J.L. Pieris. The meeting was held at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Colombo yesterday. Minister Pieris extended a warm welcome to the Ambassador Chung and stated that he looks forward to working closely with her during her tenure in Sri Lanka. Whilst noting that Sri Lanka considers the United States as an important partner, Minister Pierre has reiterated that the government is willing to work closely with the Biden administration to elevate the long-standing relations between the two countries to greater heights. Ambassador Chung assured that the United States remains committed to the promotion of a strong political-economic partnership with Sri Lanka that would contribute towards the country's prosperity. She stated that the United States wishes to deepen relations with Sri Lanka and be a constructive and producive partner for mutual benefit. Minister Beres also appraised the U.S. ambassador on the progress being made by the government with regard to reconciliation and human rights. Well, in some relief news, 
Deputy Director General of Health Services, Dr. Hemant Herat, says that the number of COVID-19 infections has drastically declined in the country, which reflects the effort that has been taken by health authorities as well as the public to control the outbreak in the country. He made these remarks while speaking to the media today. We know that at present we are daily reported number of cases has go, uh, gone below 700 a day and some people already assume that the situation is fully under control and it seems that people are in a way uh, maybe a minority but the number is gradually increasing that mm. level of adherence to the health guidelines are declining and this should not happen we have to emphasize as the Ministry of Health and we would like to request all citizens of this country. This is a very critical situation where we are we reaching another festival season and the likelihood of another surge of cases mm -hmm. after the new year. So therefore during this period as we repeatedly requested during the, uh, the previous festival time we would like to request all the citizens to adhere to the health guidelines to the letter as much as possible and thereby make yourself protected and make the community protected and prevent any further surge of cases after the new year and during this period for which you are you have the responsibility to make sure that you are adhering to the health guideline and getting your vaccination done appropriately so that finally you will be protected and the community will be protected. And now to bring you stories of the coronavirus global perspective. As Hong Kong reports tens of thousands of coronavirus cases each day, the city's large population of unvaccinated elderly residents have resulted in the highest official death rate per capita of any jurisdiction during the pandemic. Only about 30% of Hong Kong residents over 80 have been double vaccinated despite vaccines being freely available for more than a year amid widespread vaccine hesitancy among the elderly. Of 2,365 COVID-19 deaths in the city's fifth wave so far, 87% were aged 60 or above and about 90% were not fully vaccinated. Many of the deaths have occurred in the city's aged care facilities and 87% of which have reported infections involving 16,200 residents and 4,470 staff members. The resulting surge in infections has overwhelmed the public health care system, stretching the capacity of isolation wards, in intensive care facilities and mortuaries to their limit. Currently, there are 451.8 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide, with deaths totaling up to 6 million cases. The number of persons who have recovered from COVID-19 are set to be at 386 million. The spouse of the Prime Minister, Mrs. Shiranti Vikramasinghe Rajapaksa, says that the Sri Lankan woman has fulfilled a historic duty in the social, economic and political spheres in Sri Lanka. She made these remarks while delivering the keynote address via online video technology at the International Women's Day session held in Jakarta, Indonesia today. The session was conducted by the Indonesian Ministry of Women, Empowerment and Child Protection. The theme of the event was Powerful Women Are Brave to Speak. Hi, everyone. Empowerment of women has been an extremely important feature which could be traced into the greatest historical books of Sri Lanka. Sri Lankan women have always been in the forefront in making the wisest decisions taken and safeguarding the interest of their families. The sad part of the life of a woman especially the Asian counterpart, is that their struggle to make their home fires burning goes unnoticed by their male partners. Domestic abuse, which mostly goes unreported, is one of the saddest situations our females have to face. This brings to my mind the female migrant workers who leave their homes in search of providing much needed finances 
for their family being misused and sexually abused by their employers. We owe these helpless women in our society the security and well-being which would help them to delegate their duties with confidence. Historically, Sri Lankan women have played an important role socially, economically and politically. Her Excellency Madam Sirimavo Bandaranaika, who was the first woman Prime Minister in the world, is a growing example of the capabilities of a female. I would like to see our nations working together to share knowledge about the steps each nation is taking to empower women and how those steps are progressing over time. Let us unite empower women to sail through the storm for we believe that she is a strong enough. Together with all the brave women in the world, stand up to end the chain of violences and empower women. Now in other news, Commander of the Sri Lanka Air Force, Air Marshal Sudarshana Patirana says steps will be taken to establish an aviation and space center as the need for an Air Force security system rises. He made these remarks while addressing a religious ceremony held at the Jayashree Mahabodhya historic site in Anuradhapura to invoke the blessings of the flags and for the flags of the Sri Lanka Air Force. The event was held marking the 71st anniversary of the Sri Lanka Air Force. The ceremony to invoke blessings for the Air Force flags was conducted after the Air Force commander called on Atamastana Adipati Venerable Sirinivasa Thera. Chief incumbents of the Atamastana temples, temples were present at this occasion. The operations of the Department of Government Factory in Kulannava, which was only limited for state mechanical engineering projects, have been further expanded. This has been initiated based on the instructions directed by the Prime Minister. Many benefits have been achieved following the expansion of operations in the field of mechanical engineering by competing in the open market. As the manufacturing of machinery instead of importing the equipment would save the foreign exchange in the country, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa instructed the government factory to expedite the relevant operations accordingly. An order has also been placed to manufacture hundreds of machinery which could fragment leaves and branches required for the production of compost fertilizer. The Department of Government Factory in Kolonava has said that 24 machines which could peel cowpea seeds have been manufactured thus far and it is expected to manufacture other innovative machinery in the future. The department has already saved 200 million rupees worth of foreign exchange for the country last year. It's all about those coaching kills and also about timing. Just making it to that squad is all more important as the Asian Games qualifying rounds are taking place. Absolutely. The second tournament to select the Sri Lanka Athletic squad to take part in the Asian Games was held at the Diagama Mahindra Rajapaksa Stadium and the tournament will in fact be held for two days. Many national level athletes are taking part in this tournament. The athletes who were selected in the first qualifying round of the tournament as well as the athletes who performed at the second qualifying round of the tournament will be included in the squad. The Athletics Association has said that the athletes already included in the super squad will also take part in the tournament and those who perform exceptionally will be retained in the squad. The National Rowing Championship organized by the Sri Lanka Rowing Association commenced today at the Diawan Nawa. The tournament organized for the 30th occasion consists of 46 events. The matches of the third week of the Under-23 Cricket League organized by Sri Lanka Cricket were concluded recently. Gevindu Dikwella from the Ragama Sports Club was able to score a double century during a league match. The fourth week of the league is set to begin tomorrow.
Well, that's a wrap on tonight's Rupavahini English News. Join us once again tomorrow at the very same time. Until then, thanks for watching. Take care. Have a good night.